Welcome today, everyone, to our panel discussion on art and architecture for worship spaces, featuring Michael Crosby, who will be the leader of our ACLS 2023 Summer Retreat. And that is going to be August 17th to the 20th at Mount Angel Abbey in Oregon. So we hope that many of you will be there. Our question today is what moves a millennial? How do we design and adorn worship spaces that speak to younger generations? What are younger people looking for in a worship space? In other words, how can we as artists, architects, and liturgical consultants attract, help attract young people and help the church grow in the 21st century? Our retreat this summer is going to be focusing on these and other questions. And today's webinar will serve as an introduction to both the topic as well as the architect, former editor in chief of Faith and Form and University of Hartford professor, Michael Crosby. The panel will include Gilbert Sangera, liturgical consultant, Sarah hempel Arani, sculptor, and Paul Barabo, architect. So let's begin. Okay, and just a quick check to see if everyone can see that. The yeah. first slide. Mm -hmm. Got it? Okay. Uh, thank you. Again, my name is uh, Gilbert Singera, and I am serving uh, as kind of the panel coordinator for this. Uh, when this topic came up for the retreat, the webinar committee thought it would be helpful if we uh, tried to get a better understanding of what this uh, notion of millennials and their engagement in churches, especially in the built environment, what that might be to entail. So three of us uh, have selected to do quick uh, presentations uh, to kind of outline that. I'll be presenting uh, on the arena of a space consultant and um, Paul Barabu uh, from Growth Design in Milwaukee will be speaking as the practicing architect and Sarah Hempel Irani from Hempel Studios will be presenting uh, from the uh, Will Brocious, if you can turn it. Yes, thank you. So um, we'll, there'll be five to seven minute presentations. Uh, Michael will respond to what he's seen. We'll move to the next one. Uh, Michael will respond. Third one, Michael will respond. And then we'll open it up for uh, the, the group to have any questions. So just one second. So I'll be presenting on uh, two projects that uh, developed in my consulting service here at the University of Detroit Mercy. Uh, the first one is at the Hospital of St. Mary Mercy in a suburb of Detroit. Early in the process, the building committee uh, began asking um, the larger question of what does this mean for uh, the space to really be of use? to a very divergent group of users. So the building committee was comprised of uh, hospital staff uh, and personnel, uh, a daily mass community that goes to mass at that grouping, as well as uh, some of the Eucharistic ministers that bring Eucharist out to the different groups. But early on, it was realized that a Catholic chapel in and of itself would not be serving the larger religious needs of all of the users of the space, especially uh, the staff and um, surgeons, doctors, nurses who are making life and death decisions all day long. So um, we ended up breaking the chapel into three prayer spaces. One is a Roman Catholic chapel uh, for daily mass and the visitation of staff uh, again seeking refuge. Uh, the larger Muslim population that's uh, very uh, big here in the metro Detroit area and their need for prayer space five times a day with proper ablution uh, space as well as a place that doesn't have imagery 
And we didn't want to sacrifice um, using more traditional images in the Roman Catholic chapel. And then we determined that the seeker space uh, was critical because of the need to uh, look at that question of these millennials who were considered nons, N-O-N-E-S, spiritual non-religious. So they probably were raised in a traditional mainline faith tradition, but no longer. We also realized that um, this grouping might entail uh, folks from other faith traditions, especially Hinduism and the Jewish faith community. And so uh, the Catholic chapel uh, was named after St. Francis of Assisi. It's the Felician order, and that's one of their patron saints. One of the key things that we wanted was that the door be transparent enough so that people would begin to see what was inside. Again, we're assuming that these um, seekers uh, would be adjacent to the, the traditional Catholic worship space, and by their ability to see into the space, even if the door is closed, uh, they might be enticed to come in and explore. So the door is rather large and unique. The interior space of the Catholic uh, worship space uh, is unique. Uh, the architects Ply Plus out of Ann Arbor was looking specifically at issues of Baroque geometry. Uh, we uh, made sure that the altar and the tabernacle had their own distinctive spaces within the sanctuary, as well as uh, traditional stations of the cross that are in scalloped spaces. So as one stands in front, each uh, station is something one can concentrate on. We also used dichroic glass, which allowed for this kind of beautiful uh, shifting color scheme uh, near the tabernacle. Again, the adjacency to the Catholic worship space was critical for uh, this to work. Uh, one of the key things we did was not put a door on the seeker space to make it as open and inviting as possible, as well as creating a portal, so a thickened space that they pass through so that they feel like they're entering another, another type of space. Uh, what the committee decided was that nature was a critical part for uh, millennials and the care of nature. And so that became the focal point of the chapel. It was in an outdoor garden, so large, uh, full windows, floor to ceiling uh, were uh, created. Again, the focus is on the Japanese maple and uh, rock. And the notion of the maple was that, again, it goes through a life cycle as people are thinking of their own life cycle issues. Uh, then we made sure that the green, uh, glazing of that courtyard was brought into um, was brought into the uh, chapel space itself, or again, this room. Uh, we also provided multiple ways of seating. One of the things we realized is that there might be a family that needs to do a consult with one of the doctors about uh, near death or palliative care issues, and that maybe a small group prayer might occur in this space, but trying to provide options for different ways of seating, whether that's individual, in couples, or in groups. Um, the portal that leads you out focuses primarily on this prayer wall that you see. And that prayer wall uh, we found was important so people could leave their prayer intention. And again, it's kind of like the wailing wall idea that they just place into these little tubes various prayers that they have. The second space uh, is a very small stylized ecumenical prayer chapel. So for Christian non-Catholics, we're Catholic Jesuit Mercy University. So we have a beautiful uh, Catholic chapel, but for the Christians, we realized we needed something, especially for the millennials. So the focus on this space was primarily uh, the use of labyrinth and the idea of seeking. And in the labyrinth, you can barely see it, are quotations from a whole uh, group of wisdom figures, Christian and non-Christian. Uh, interestingly enough, we had a Madonna and child from a, 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 a chapel that the Mercies had that was no longer being in use. So we decided to use that as the element that drew people in because it was so stylized, the Madonna and child uh, didn't necessarily uh, come off as the Madonna and child, but just a mother and child. 
uh, the use of cork floor and natural materials, things that were ecologically sensitive reused. And then we had floor cushions so people could really develop their own kind of seating in this type of space. The other thing that we did was we made sure that the um, focal point within the chapel were shelves where art could be displayed in different manners. So the St. John Bible, uh, patron saints, uh, it could be uh, some kind of ecological issue that they might be looking at. Um, and so just to make it as uh, diverse as possible. Also, uh, we began looking at uh, QR codes where uh, people coming to use the chapel could um, go to a curated web page that specifically began to look at uh, different ways of experiencing prayer, whether that's through music, through Lexio Divino, or the Jesuit examine. So they can kind of click on a different web page and using their personal um, computer or phone, they're able to experience the space in different ways. The other thing, again, we also did was to put a cross on the outside of the window uh, so that the space felt like it was expanding out. And whatever their prayer experience, that it be filtered into uh, this Catholic community. Uh, and again, we've added another prayer wall. And one of the things the committee was thinking about is being able to leave a little bit of your prayer intention or leave a prayer or to leave a trace that you've been in this space. Uh, so with that, I will conclude my portion of the presentation and I open it up for Michael Crosby for any comments and then we'll move on to the next one. Thanks, Gilbert. Um, these are really two, to me, <laughs> two really beautiful projects. Um, I uh, The first one that you showed is actually a Faith and Forum award winner from a year or two ago, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, I think there's so many really, really great moves in here uh, in both of these projects in terms of a uh, attracting a younger uh, sort of millennial type of uh, audience uh, and user. Um, I was uh, particularly interested um, in the choice of St. Francis for this, um, for this seeker space uh, as a, as a saint. Um, and um, could you talk a little bit about you, you, there's there's something on the slide that said this is an acceptable saint or uh, you know he, he gets high marks from millennials or something like that and right so about that sure uh saint francis was actually um connected the felicians have um him as one of their saints of uh, devotion yeah uh, so that was helpful but then we also just again, in talking, uh, there were a number of millennials actually kind of in the design committee. Um, that So the chapel is named for St. Francis of Assisi, but we placed it outside near the seeker space so that uh, it becomes accessible. I might've had a typo on the slide, but it was meant to be an accessible state. In other words, one that uh, recognizes ecological issues, uh, the creation, care for the earth. So it has a spirituality that goes beyond kind of normal doctrinal, you know, it's not a uh, Thomas Aquinas, it's not a, um, you know, John Paul II, you know, it's it's not one of these more, not, I wouldn't say polarizing figures, but ones that have more dogmatic issues within the church. And we thought that would make it easier. That's it's true. interesting that chapel was um, the whole, uh, both of those chapels and the Muslim prayer space were open just before COVID hit. So we haven't had a chance to see how it's getting used. We do know that people are using the Catholic chapel side. And yeah. all of my students, when I take them to see it, they say the seeker space is someplace they can pray in. And I have to admit, I'm a little bewildered by that because I'm thinking focusing on a Japanese maple just doesn't, <laughs> doesn't cut it for me. But for them, they're like, yeah, this is this is it. I can kind of unplug and be in this kind of yeah, space. Yeah, I, and I, I could see, even though St. Francis is really kind of more associated with the Catholic space, correct? In terms correct, of, yeah. Yeah, 
I could see where um, uh, being in a in a space where you're looking out of uh, the window uh, towards a towards a plant or a, a tree would be something that I think St. Francis would appreciate as well. You know? Right, right, so, right. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting is that um, the way you've created this this gate um, on the Catholic space, um, which allows you to look through it uh, before you actually enter that space. And one of the things that I've heard over and over again with the, the one of the things that especially millennials have with a traditional church is the idea of having to make a decision about going into a space without mm -hmm. being able to see it first, you know? Um, and uh, I think that was handled really, really well. The idea that you get a sort of a view in uh, before you make a commitment. Um, and I think a lot of millennials um, uh, in terms of uh, the research that I've been aware of have this kind of commitment issue in terms of do I really want to commit to something especially if I don't know what it's about or I don't know what that space on the other side is you know mm -hmm. traditional uh, worship spaces t tend to be opaque from the outside you know we have big big heavy doors and we have uh, windows stained glass windows that don't allow us to see in so I think those moves uh, and th those decisions were were quite um, uh, 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 interesting, you know, in terms of a, a, attracting that that particular kind of uh, user. The other thing that I thought was fascinating was the idea of kind of having it both ways with how you enter the seeker space. Um, uh, the fact that you don't have a door, I think, even sort of even magnifies that uh, opportunity to sort of peer in or check it out before you go in and make a commitment about going in and sitting down. But what I think was really particularly interesting about that uh, is the thickness of the wall uh, going into the transition as a transition. And um, we know traditionally that great sacred spaces always give us some sort of sense of threshold right that we uh -huh. we cross something that something is different inside than it is outside or vice versa and usually that threshold is connected to some kind of a door that we push open and we we walk across some kind of a a saddle or a or a piece of stone or something like that the fact that this this when you pass into this space the wall sort of thickens up, I think sort of it really kind of uh, beautifully uh, operates in that in that fashion without having to deter people by having to push a door open. And I thought that was that was quite well done. I, basically, I think these spaces really have some very, very uh, interesting moves. The last one I thought, I thought the QR codes was a fascinating idea. Um, I don't know how many times I've sat in sacred space and I kind of look around uh, and I start, <laughs> I start Googling, you know, things that I'm curious about in terms of the space, right? And I know maybe that's not a prayerful thing to do, but uh, it, it kind of allows me to get information about the place while I'm sitting there. Um, and uh, th this is definitely an op an activity that millennials engage in all the time. You know, my my kids are constantly got their phones out when we're talking to them, and they're they're kind of checking stuff out that we're talking about while we're talking about it. Um, so um, the other thing about that space and the and the previous one was this idea of leaving something behind. This idea of the of the 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 wall. Uh, sort of functioning like the wailing wall where you 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 can leave a prayer. And when I led a studio of millennials a couple of years ago at Catholic University for designing sacred space, a lot of them incorporated this kind of notion of leaving something of themselves behind in, in the space. So uh, 
yeah, I generally, I think there's some really, really astute moves in both of these sacred spaces that would respond, that do respond to that kind of age group, you know, without losing it for right. older, older users. Yeah, and that's, that's going to be our next uh, presentation, actually, uh, looking at this question of how do you incorporate, because these two ones were uh, purposefully designed for a kind of uh, smaller groups and specialized groups, but parish churches begin to be uh, slightly different. So I'm going to bring up that presentation, which okay. will be from Paul Baraboo. Okay. Okay, Paul. Take it away. Great. So what I'm going to be showing is a uh, congregation, um, a parish church, uh, non-Catholic, um, that uh, is at the threshold of a uh, historic um, hundred year anniversary and the building is 80 years old. And it, over the years, has been uh, um, in some ways gutted and uh, is feeling the effects of its age and is in need of restoration. And part of what we're seeing in that process is a marked difference between the people who have, who are of a generation that looks at identity differently than younger groups of people. Some of the uh, readings and sources on the difference between aging, um, particularly for before um, the mid 60s versus after the mid 60s suggests that uh, the older generations identified by institutional membership. I think some of that for uh, parish churches or congregations that are in neighborhoods has to do with the availability or lack thereof of transportation so many families walk to church, they look to the parish, um, the geographic area to find the source of belonging and the source of civic centeredness. Um, and for younger generations that are much more mobile, much more flexible and in fact uh, wired, um, they often find their connection not through a grounded institution or from a uh, an institu institution that they just become a part of and then uh, connect with, but by experience rather than just membership. Next slide, Gil. So this is the church that um, I'm using as an example of that. It's from the 1920s. Uh, the uh, church um, it, as its setting has pieces that were very likely pulled out of catalog including the, the art class, the Araritas altar, and uh, the statue in the front of the church. Pews lined up in a regimented uh, kind of legion format. Next slide, Gil. Part of what we needed and wanted to do was expand the altar platform and to provide a great amount of flexibility and functionality for participatory experience. So, the music programming at this church is a part of the vitality of the future of the congregation and the rigid lineup of pews did not uh, allow for flexibility or accessibility uh, to be able to fully engage the arts in the worship. Next slide. You can see over the years um, the historic images, the image on the left is the current situation. Uh, the art in the church, the supportive art, stenciling and uh, artwork surrounding the rare altar and the statue of Christ are, was much more uh, vigorous in previous generations. In the uh, I believe in the 80s, the church was renovated and much of that artwork was stripped out of the space. The image of Christ, as you can see, was poor, poorly lit. And, um, and in fact, that uh, catalog uh, statue of Christ engages only the person standing three feet in front of the altar and the uh, gesture of the 
of the uh, figure is really um, more personal consecration of elements rather than engaging community. Next slide. Part of what we are seeking to do with this space is to restore both the quality and the beauty of the original stenciling in the apps to support what feels like a, uh, a rare desalter that's too small for the space because the arts that were previously in the walls of the apps helped expand that uh, pres the presence of that piece. We're looking for authenticity and um, particularly in the statue, a much more relational connection, not with presider at worship, but with the entire congregation. And so the hope is whether the rarest is retained or a new piece is replaces that, that the statue itself will be re uh, commissioned with a new piece that will be better lit, uh, better quality, and directed uh, to the congregation as a whole, rather than just to the celebrants at worship. Next slide. Uh, you can see here in this before picture uh, or current picture, in the removal of the arts from the apse of the church, the strongest visual uh, compelling piece in this architecture are the art glass windows and the presence of the apse is uh, uh, not, it's the, the presence just is not there. Next slide. The restoration of this piece is, uh, of the architecture is to provide enough um, of the uh, visual focus toward the front. This is what that piece will look like with the stenciling uh, fully engaged right now. This is very conceptual. Next slide. And with the statuary, not only better lit, but with an image that will not be positioned down to the celebrant, but uh, outward uh, reaching to the entire congregation. So that it's not just about observing worship. It's not just about being member, but there is a relational connection between the congregation and the symbol that is in front of the congregation. Next slide. The church is also contemplating removing the raritas entirely, which does not, uh, the existing raritas does not match the style of the church. It's actually different styles in the building. And part of the um, desire is to incorporate more of arts and crafts language, which is very present in their windows. And rather than to have a set static raritas with a statue to incorporate artwork that is um, more in, uh, engaging and also has some relational uh, connection to the art that is in the windows. So they are contemplating also a triptych. Part of the challenge of this process is that the church, um, older members that are used to seeing the traditional or the existing furnishings in the front are having a difficult time moving beyond that uh, to then a group that is um, looking for something that's more relational, fresh, and newer. Next slide. And so this uh, design of this piece is, is intentional to provide more current inclus inclusion and diversity, relational presence, and invitation. Next slide. And this is what that piece would look like in the space. Next slide. And then with the uh, arms uh, or the doors of the triptych open. And then last slide, I think, Gil. And then just the two. This church has not made this decision. They will be voting on how to proceed in the next uh, two weeks. The committee is made up of both older members and newer members, and the committee has had a difficult process deciding 
on which direction to proceed. So it'll be interesting to see how that will end up in the near, uh, in the next month. Okay, Paul, thank you. Uh, this is a really fascinating project <laughs> to me, just given the the, the uh, theme of what we're looking at. Um, could you tell me, you just mentioned the, the building committee. Um, what, what kinds of behavior, not, you know, what, what kinds of interaction do you see among the different aged members of this group? So, of course, uh, part of what the, this group is wrestling with is um, there are people in the church that have had the look of this building, even with its changes over the years, uh, that have been the backdrop for the sacramental rite. While I don't think any of them are are um, less con committed and connected to beauty and inspiration, they have a familiar backdrop. Younger generations coming into the church, look at that backdrop, do not have the sacramental connection or the ritual connection to that, to the, the backdrop to the right, and are saying, this does not have meaning to me, and are able to then evaluate it a little more critically. Mm -hmm. And and another word that you uh, mentioned um, when you're doing your presentation earlier on, particularly uh, speaking about the statue, you know, this this art piece was authenticity. And I wondered how that's being talked about in terms of a, a definition. Um, yeah, so um, that piece very likely was purchased out of a catalog. It sure. is not in great shape over from yeah. over the years um and it was repainted in the 1980s renovation um but muted uh so it, it does not have the vibrancy that it probably originally had yeah. more important is this church is committed when they do artwork to have something that is uh, crafted specifically for them yeah. rather than something that's purchased out of a catalog. Nothing against catalog pieces. Some of them are, are fine pieces, but they want something that speaks to the heart of this uh, membership. Sure. Um, so uh, a couple a couple things. Um, you mentioned that the, the way that people are attracted to being members of this uh, this congregation and the older members are kind of connected to the institution itself. Um, and they sort of see that as the the strength of their membership, their 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 connection with this. While younger people are thinking about experience, right? They're thinking about what is going on in this place that makes it worthwhile for me to be part of this, right? As a as a group of people uh, worshiping, but also maybe doing good works in the community and that that sort of thing. Um, and um, I'm wondering, um, this is a really hard thing to me to translate into art, right? How do you how do you translate having an experience into some kind of art piece, right? Um, because when an older person looks at that image uh, of uh, Christ above the altar, um, he, uh, they see that's an institutional image, right? It's It's something that's solid, uh, it's it's something you can count on. It's a it's a remembrance of why we are are Christians, right? Um, where the I think the I think an, a millennial would maybe interpret this uh, as more kind of an authority figure that is yeah you, you and you might question that authority like why is this person important? Why is this what is this statue telling us about? why we should be here, right? And I think the triptych is a really interesting idea. Uh, the idea of something that transforms, that's something that can be you know, open and then shut, depending on the circumstances of what's going on at the service. But there, I, I, I question this image of, uh, the, the 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 image of Christ to me seems still authoritative. You know, this idea of him, he's the only one standing, right? Everybody else is sitting down. 
Uh, and that, that communicates a sense that I'm the more important person here and everybody else is kind of gathered around listening to me. I'm wondering whether the art might have been considered or whether you even had discussions about this as, as Christ kind of also sitting down uh, in a position where he's equal to the other people that are around him. And perhaps they're doing something. Maybe he's healing somebody or maybe he's dividing the loaves and the fishes, you know, and maybe he's feeding someone, you know, because I think that these types of activities are what attract millennials to religion. You know, the idea is if I'm going to be part of this congregation, I want my work to be having, a, having an impact on somebody else's life. I think that's why a lot of millennials either get involved, right? They want to see the experience. They want to see something happening because I'm part of this congregation, you know? It's interesting um, that... Uh the the window so that there are two great windows in the space yeah uh one is uh the fisherman uh in the boat and the other is jesus sitting with children and um also interesting to note is uh so the artwork in the triptych uh for sure that the the door panels will be uh removable and so they can yeah. be updated and a change with season of the church and be uh -huh. more relational or less relational and part of the uh so none of this artwork is commissioned yet yeah i pulled in internet images off to use and i specifically wanted something that i felt was going to bridge between the expectations of the younger generation and still feel familiar enough to the older generation to be able to be accepted by both but the the commissioning of the artwork hasn't happened yet because sure. we don't know that this is going to actually happen. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's, it's, it's a fascinating uh, project because it's, I mean, you're, <laughs> you're dealing with a lot of questions here about perception and uh, you know, this sort of relational quality, you know, it's and, and, do, and, and, and uh, dealing with the idea that these things mean different different things to different people of different generations so this fascinating and, project and with that i'll need to move us to our last presenter and again great uh insight and great questioning about that and a wonderful um transition into the notion of aesthetics uh for uh, millennials and that'll be sarah hempel irani thank you so much uh so in in thinking about building for the future uh, I'm going to discuss four things as they pertain to the millennial aesthetic, um, which, you know, it's millennials are not a monolith, but this, these are the things that I've observed about um, that they care about authenticity, hospitality, telling the story and making it beautiful. Uh, next slide. So this is kind of the, the crisis at hand is that we know that millennials and Gen Z's are um, spiritual, but not religious. Uh, they don't go to church in the same numbers um, that previous generations have. And, um, you know, there's a lot of hand wringing, but I, but I also think there's a lot of opportunity here. And I, I think, um, you know, I'm really thankful for this group for um, looking at that, often, um, at that opportunity. Uh, next slide. So first thing is, who are we talking about when we talk about millennials? Uh, millennials are the generation born between 1981 and 1996. Uh, they're they're not children anymore. And they're the oldest millennials are 40, and they're buying homes and and some of them are starting families. Uh, they came of age during recession, um, after 9/11, political polarization, dis digitization. Um, but when we think of millennials, we think of of hip young people who are always connected to their phones, with AirPods in their ears. But, but they also listen to vinyl. Um, they hang out in quirky coffee shops and indie bookstores, and they ride single-speed bikes. Next slide. They spend their time online scrolling through Instagram, Pinterest, Etsy, DIY blogs. They also knit. This is a generation that made artisanal cool. Next slide. So I want to talk about authenticity. Millennials and uh, Gen Zs are living in a mostly ersatz digital world, meaning it's not real. Um, their interest in handmade goods and quote unquote authentic experiences are directed 
are a direct response to commercialism, mass market consumerism, and, and the sort of inauthenticity of the modern world. And true authenticity is deep, deeply, deeply matters to millennials that I, I think we've seen. Uh, so last month I went to, wait, go back to the books. <laughs> last month I went to a book event at an indie bookshop in DC uh, with Cal Newport, who's a millennial and author of books such as Digital Minimalism and A World Without Email. And he was talking with David Sachs, who is the author of The Future is Analog. David Sachs argues that we've seen the rise of digital. It has been met with an analog response. For example, he says, uh, once we could stream music on a massive scale, record shops popped up. When the Kindle became ubiquitous, we saw a rise in indie bookshops. And it was cool that the event took place at an indie bookshop. The pandemic thrust us all deeper into the internet and there have been some beautiful things such as opportunities such as this. Um, but the more time people spent online, the more time ways we sought to, to be real, to engage our real world. Um, for example, many of us learned to bake bread. Next slide. Next slide. <laughs> In fact, a millennial sourdough master gave me a starter and then he bought this little nursing Madonna and he and his family built this beautiful little shrine for her. Um, and, and he provides me with sourdough, which is such a millennial aesthetic right here. Uh, next slide. This is an example of millennial hospitality. Hospitality is really important to millennials. This is not a stock photo. This is an event um, in the springtime at a friend's house who is a millennial. This was her table. Next slide. This is an example of church hospitality. And this is also not a stock photo. How do we expect millennials to respond to this? Next slide. This is the generation that gave us artisanal coffee. And then they come to church and we offer, you know, percolator coffee and disposable cups. Next slide. And yet, Hospitality is more than how we decorate our tables and the kinds of beverages we offer. Hospitality is not only how we welcome one another, but how we welcome the stranger. And as designers, we can build spaces that facilitate hospitality and communicate it through deliberate and intentional design choices. For example, single gender, uh, handicap accessible restrooms, accessibility throughout the building, acoustics that are friendly for our autistic blind or deaf siblings in Christ. Next slide. Hospitality is also the inclusion of cultural identities outside of our dominant Eurocentric aesthetics. Our work that represents diversity in an authentic and non-tokenism way, as we've seen here in the beautiful communion of saints um, tapestries at Our Lady of Angels in Los Angeles. Um, that was done by John Nava. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. It's just Fantastic. Uh, third, so next slide. We must tell the story. And I think when we make art, we're telling an old story in a new way. And this is really, really important. At the heart of the gospel, which is the whole point of church, right, is, is the gospel. It is a story that begins with an invisible God becoming one of us. It's the abstract made particular. It's a particular person named Jesus who was born into a particular family at a particular time and place. James Joyce said, for myself, I always write about Dublin because if I can get to the heart of Dublin, I can get to the heart of all the cities of the world. It is the particular contained in the universal. And this is what we were doing when we make sacred art. We are containing the universal in the particular. Next slide. So this is a sculpture that I made of St. Joseph for Our Lady of Mercy in Potomac. Um, that's a suburb outside of DC. And I understand that white marble isn't without some cultural baggage. However, in this work, I tried giving St. Joseph a particular face and expression in the next slide. I sought to connect on him with some visceral level. Next slide. When I thought of my own father's hands, dirty and calloused from years of hard work. Can you go back one slide? So you can see St. Joseph in this sculpture, his hands are worn and rough and he's going to hold the infant Christ. 
And I had to make it particular, real. Next slide and go to. <laughs> but lastly, we must make it beautiful. Millennials live deeply aesthetic lives. And here's another event uh, that I, again, not a stock photo. I went to this event and this was a, a gathering of the beloved community outside of the church with a parachurch group made up mostly of millennials. And the millennial aesthetic transformed an ordinary backyard into something really magical and dare I say, transcendent. This aesthetic is possible and millennials are, are doing this in their own homes and their own backyards and in, in the way that they gather. And at least in my experience of church, we're not bringing it in. And in our approach to church design, we must be authentic. We must design for hospitality and the totality of hospitality. And we must tell the story, the particular story. And in all of it, we must make it beautiful to reach this generation, these generations. And they're having a crisis of meaning and identity. And we all crave real authentic ways of connecting to the divine and one another, our environment. And I think in the church, we have such an opportunity to respond with what I call an analog authenticity, sort of a, an antithesis to this digital or sats world that, that we can gather together. Um, we can hear and participate in live music. We can marvel at art that's made by human hands and engage in real community face-to-face. -face. So, thank you. Thank you, Sarah and Michael. Sarah, that's a great presentation. Thank you. <laughs> and I really appreciate you thinking about how this, I think this idea of approaching this from the aesthetic view um, is, is really uh, very, very valid. Um, and um, I was just thinking about the weekend I spent. I was in Washington, D.C. this past weekend with my millennial kids, you know, <laughs> and uh, we we were having all these sort of experiences, you know, that's sort of like, let's do this and let's go to a, this pizza place where they kind of make the pie right in front of you. And, 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 you know, there were just a lot of things that you touched on that were uh, absolutely you know, uh, zero in on uh, some of the things that I experienced over the weekend. Um, and, um, you know, the, the the writer Alvin Toffler, uh, who nobody reads anymore, um, <laughs> mentioned that uh, 40 years ago when he, uh, when he wrote his kind of important book, The Third Wave, talked about we were living in a high tech world and that the if we live in this world of high tech, we need high touch. You know, he was he was sort of balancing this idea of, you know, the more digital we go, oh, even 40 years ago, the more analog we need in terms of uh, some kind of a balance in our lives. And I thought probably the best slides, <laughs> the best two slides you showed was the coffee hour at the at the church, you know. And the, 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 the antidote to that, which was, you know, a place where people felt welcomed, uh, where there was some kind of, you know, wonderful design in the coffee, you know, uh, and that um, uh, people are looking for this aesthetic, at least, at least people of a certain thing, a certain age, um, and that uh, we, we have to, it's not the thing, it's how it's presented. It's mm -hmm. it is really kind of key, you know, I think, and it's hard for some people to say when they say coffee hour, they say, oh, yeah, that's a bunch of pots, uh, you know, sitting on a table with with cardboard uh, cups, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's coffee hour. So they're not thinking about what it is. They're thinking of, you know, you know the thing about this is an event, but they're not really curating the event, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that I think the. The idea of curating an experience is something that a lot of congregations have yet to get their heads into, mm -hmm. so to speak, you know, oh, yeah. that it's like, if you pro just provide this, they'll come. But <laughs> one thing that you touched on is that millennials are very, very suspicious about being marketed to. Mm -hmm. um, they really kind of recoil at that idea. 
Uh, and that sort of gets back to the whole idea of authenticity. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, we only had got about 10 minutes left. I'd li really like to open this up to everyone here uh, that's been part of this presentation. For questions. So the, the floor is open. <laughs> and either you can uh, just call it out or if you want to put it in the chats and uh, Pam and I'll keep an eye out on those. I will throw out uh, Linda, one just... Linda, you need to unmute. Damn. Well, I wanted to ask a quick question. Um, Paul, when I saw the triptych that you did, which I thought was very exciting an idea, um, especially when you said the two side panels could be changed out. That's really cool. Um, did any of those figures, it looked to me like one of the, at least one of the figures had contemporary dress. And if not, have you considered that? You're on mute, you're on mute, Paul. So uh, do not invest too much in those images. I needed to have something to represent yeah. uh, in, in those slides, but I would not be surprised if there is not some connection to current, uh, you know, a blending of current and historic in the same images mm -hmm. and a greater diversity. Uh, this is a relatively small town in Wisconsin, but there still is phenomenal diversity. And, uh, but it is a conservative church. So how much representation beyond standard uh, norm is, uh, uh, will become a part of the artwork is yet to be seen. Okay. But it does need to represent who they see themselves as and who they want to attract. I think that's part of the challenge here is that people have a choice of where they go to worship. It's not like it was years ago where you just went to the local place. Right. You have to reach out and engage or you don't get the people coming in from the younger generations because they have options, one of which is to just stay home. Mm -hmm. okay. I was kind of curious, this, uh, there is kind of a, a growing desire to be authentic in, uh, like even with the, uh, the saints, right? They brought in uh, mm -hmm. researchers that identified, um, you know, what does a fourth century Northern African saint look like, you know, and then matching it. And I don't know if that that ability to kind of connect with the local community is being impacted by that. And I don't know, I was just curious how uh, Michael was talking about um, the notion of authority figure. And I thought that was really kind of a brilliant insight about how much <laughs> authority is being kind of cast out there and, and almost a, a, a reviling of that. But then I'm also now wondering uh, about how how much of the art in the traditional sense that used to match the local community and now is trying to be authentic to the historic figure is, is puzzling in this. And I, I don't think know. about, you know, pastoral ministry, there is the role of the office, which is authoritative, but there's also the role of the pastor that's relational. And I think the church is always uh, in our art and in our architecture and, and, and the, the duties of the ministry of the church is always a balance between those two. Hmm. I'm wondering oh. if there's a place for um, people to talk about who millennials think of Jesus or, you know, how do they uh, portray this? How do they relate to a certain figure of Jesus or whomever? You know, um, it's not that we want Jesus there, but how do, how are they going to relate to a, a figure that's going to be sculpted or painted to put in the place? I think it's it's really interesting right now in this time in history when um, you know we're we're seeing a lot of um, people tearing down statues in you know in, in order to move in a direction of of justice. Um, and I think that this generation deeply, deeply cares about justice. And um, I think, uh, honestly, and even as a sculptor, as much as I like statues, I, I think they're they're fraught. You know, with there's a difficulty there. Um, 
you get kind of one, you know, if you're talking about depicting Jesus, you know, Jesus is God, but Jesus is also a healer. Jesus is also humble. Jesus also is the king, you know, so you have all these both and both and both and. And I, I think that's the challenge of the artist really is, is how do you um, take all of those ideas? You can't have all, you know, you have to make it particular. You have to say something. You can't say everything, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I'm kind of hoping secretly that, that, you know, folks are re-engaging with statues and saying, what does this mean to us? I mean, obviously, you know, ones that we're taking down, we're saying, oh, that represents something we don't want anymore. We're going to take that down, but what are we, are we going to put something up in its place? And so even though, you know, your statue is not necessarily offensive, it's not speaking to the congregation. And so if you take it down, you know, that is, I mean, that's, I think that's very difficult. I don't, I don't, I wish I had better answers um, to who are you putting back up? What face of Jesus? Yeah. Um, uh, Sarah, I've got a quick question. Do you work in wood? Uh, not, no, I haven't yet. I should say okay. not yet. Yes. Yeah. That's on I'm my list one, of things to learn. <laughs> yeah. The reason I brought it up is that, you know, I, the, when I saw St. Joseph, I thought, oh, why isn't this in wood? Because he you know, yeah. wood. You know, I think that, um, yeah, I think that would be great. Um, they wanted and, marble, which I'm not going to complain. Marble is amazing. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a beautiful work, uh, but it just it sort of just crossed my yeah. mind. It's like, could we connect, mm -hmm. you know, what he did uh, mm -hmm. with uh, the material that the the statue is made out of? The other thing I was curious about is that the fact that he was a crafts person um, it sort of suggests that maybe the I mean, it's a beautifully crafted thing, uh, this statue. I'm just wondering whether the statue might e express mm -hmm. some sense of becoming where, mm -hmm. you know, sort of like these Michelangelo sculptures where, you know, they're just, you know, the person is emerging out of mm -hmm. them. And you can mm -hmm. see the chisel marks, right? Uh, which suggests to us that another person is actually making this thing, you know, mm -hmm. that there's a craft element involved. But uh, the stuff that just floated through my head while I was, while I was it's interesting Michael that you say that the the sculpture that we're hoping to if they if that church retains the rarities I would prefer to see as natural wood carved um and but we know that the older members of the congregation are used to seeing a painted plaster statue yeah. and so we're trying to we're trying to span between the expectations of those connected to nature and those connected to the historic right of that particular congregation. Yeah. And if you have somebody, somebody I'm sorry, sorry, brainstorming about sculpture, that's okay. Sorry. I was just going to say that I, a couple of things. It seems to me that the, the situation that you're talking about, Paul, is very, very common in that there's an interior that no longer expresses what this congregation is and maybe who they're trying to attract. Um, so there's, I mean, I'm thinking of a church in San Francisco, this very Italianate, um, a sort of a pastiche of, of um, Veronese and Titian and, and it's fine, but it is people walk in that church and they think, oh, well, I know what this is about and I wanna go somewhere else. Whereas this is a, the congregation is very, it's very young, it's very socially conscious. They're always out, Pro, you know, that's what everyone does in San Francisco. It's March on the weekends. And so um, they need an image that's going to say to the person walking in, oh, yes, Marilyn is <laughs> laughing because she lives in San Francisco. Um, so that, that expresses that um, who they are. And I think that, and, and there, yes, there are older people in those congregations. And I think that it's, it's really a, a process of, of educating the congregation and never meet my senses, no change should ever split a congregation. And they're terrible stories about congregations being split. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if it takes years, then it takes years. But I think that they're, and this is probably very naive to say that this can always be done without acrimony. But I think that to, to, to involve the congregation in these decisions and say, you know, here's some historical examples, here's some, you know, here's some more contemporary art, and, and just that work with um, work with the congregation in such a way that they say, 
yeah, you know, we could do this. Or So that's just what I think is an ideal anyway. Thank you, Peggy. And I, it's time for us to close out now. I want to thank Michael for being here with us. Okay. And I am looking thank forward you, to seeing him in person, not digital. <laughs> uh, the analog August. me. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.